There are few better feelings in life than knowing when your time was well spent, when you've made good memories with good people. On December 11th, 2020, I stared at the title screen for Cyberpunk 2077 for the first time, totally unaware of how it would change the way I viewed games and what I thought they were capable of. It was more than a title screen. It was a point of no return. I haven't been able to stop thinking about Cyberpunk and the incredible journey its world, systems, and characters took me on since then. Today, we have a city to burn. It's time for me to show you why I fell in love with the dark future envisioned by Mike Pondsmith and CD Projekt Red. This is... Cyberpunk 2077, my new favorite game. The year is 2077. Mega corporations rule an autonomous city of their creation with an iron fist. In their insatiable greed, these companies have created a society so hostile that its citizens must routinely debase themselves just to live. The world of cyberpunk is its first character you meet, and my stay in Night City is the best open world experience I've ever had. A game has never convinced me that I was living another life as quickly as Cyberpunk. This is because it's a game where, even more than in others, immersion is necessary to set the stage for the story it's trying to tell. You need to believe you're in Night City. You also need to believe that you are V, a solo mercenary in a race against time. Cyberpunk's presentation is arguably its most important component, as it's responsible for persuading players of these things through the entirety of the game. Its masterful use of first-person perspective and a visual fidelity that you sometimes cannot even believe is possible are some of the tools the game uses to immerse players in the dystopian scenarios they're going to find themselves in. Starting out, the game wastes no time in embroiling you into daily life in Night City based on the life path you choose. As a corpo, you're tasked with the assassination of your boss's company rival. As a street kid, you take a job to steal an exotic car. And as a nomad, you're hired to smuggle contraband across the border. The narration of the V and Jackie montage that follows further sells you on the idea that you're in a world where crime is largely inevitable, but worth the risk to secure a better life and to become a Night City legend. Every game has to make a first impression, but few can claim to make one as strongly as Cyberpunk does because its prologues serve not only as introductions to its world and characters, but also to the sheer scope of the game itself. While the game's intros offer you glimpses of the city, it's only once you're allowed to roam free that its gargantuan scale really sets in. Walking through Night City is unlike walking through any video game city ever constructed. I use the term constructed deliberately because Night City doesn't feel like it was made in a video game world editor. It feels like it was constructed by real people. Very greedy and corrupt people in a time where building regulations are a distant memory. The story Night City tells just through its architecture is fascinating. It's clear there was a war in Night City, megacorps fighting over the amount of real estate each could take and how they could maximize the profitability of their spaces. This led to behemoths of structures that consist of buildings built on top of other buildings and mega blocks so tall they touch the sky. Depending on where you are in Night City, you may barely see the sky. Some areas are so dense with towering infrastructure, you feel like an ant surrounded by blades of grass. Unfortunately, being small and insignificant won't stop the city from trying to exploit you. Consumerism here is omnipresent, and you can't take two steps without advertisements preying on your basic needs 
or your wildest fantasies. In Night City, where there isn't metal and concrete, there's plastic and skin. The irony of Night City is that it's merely the logical conclusion of founder Richard Knight's corporate-run utopian vision, a place built with no oversight and no humanity. There was a war in Night City. The corporations won, its people lost. The people of Night City are equally as interesting and important in selling you on the city's experience as the hyper-capitalist hellscape itself. Its inner streets and alleys tell other tales, stories of opportunity and those that failed in the pursuit of them. This reminded me of another game I love, 1998's Unreal. It's a game about a prison transport that crash lands on an alien planet. As you explore this new world, you find bodies of other crash survivors with message logs on them documenting their experiences in this foreign land until their deaths. Words can't express the joy I felt when I realized Cyberpunk had this same mechanic and that it expanded on it by further incorporating it into its gameplay. All across Night City, you'll find the final resting place of many unfortunate gonks, along with data shards explaining their final moments or how they wound up in their situations. Maybe they got fried trying to get through corporate ice. Maybe they botched a gig. Or maybe they were set up by people they trusted. There are even data shard entries that point you to other locations on the map and those that are part of a larger story you have to decipher through exploration. One of my favorite examples of this is the story of Joanne Koch, a Biotechnica Corpo. It began when I was walking around Corpo Plaza and found the body of a woman named Amelia Morton, who was pushed out of her job at Biotechnica after being framed by Joanne. Emilia demanded that Joanne admit to the setup, or she'd leak Biotechnica documents to the news proving that Joanne poisoned an entire town. Since Emilia is dead, the implication is that Joanne had her killed to prevent the leaks. At the time, I didn't think much of this since this is a common occurrence in Night City. After that though, I came across an NCPD assault where I wiped out a hit team that was hired to silence a journalist. This writer was trying to expose human trials conducted by Biotechnica that claimed the lives of over 70 nomads. The reason this story is one of my favorites is because if you explore this district a little bit more, you get a gig from Dino to take out the person who directed those trials. Director Joanne Koch. She finally crossed the wrong people. The families of the fallen nomads pooled their money together to make sure this ghoul died. I always let her think she's going to get away, but I've already taken care of the security, so there's no one she can run to. Then I dump her body in front of her building. Night City shines because of much more than its impressive visuals. It's also because you can see the impact the characters have on the world. I was invested in the Joanne Coke gig because I knew what type of person she was long before I met her. Being able to interact with the actions of other people living in Night City is what makes it feel so alive. This is an aspect of the game that also scales with the importance of the NPCs to continue naturally building a world you can believe in. Night City isn't just alive, it's been alive for decades, and its history is tangible because it motivates every single one of its characters. Their vocabulary, their choices, and how they interact with you is all influenced by their surroundings and circumstances. Night City is my greatest open world experience because it comes the closest to making me believe I'm really living someone else's life in another world. This was realized through a combination of stunning presentation and cyberpunk's gameplay, which is what lets you be a part of its world. Cyberpunk 2077 is an open world RPG with immersive sim elements. It performs a balancing act with all these genres, separating them within the game's content rather than attempting to mash them all together in its critical path. Cyberpunk's main missions are linear playgrounds where you get to flex your build and the grinding you've done in the open world. Its side missions feature far less combat and emphasize the game's narrative mechanics. Finally, its gigs are objective-based mini-missions where combat is optional due to their open-ended design. 
I love open world games, and Cyberpunk's approach is so refreshing because of the gameplay diversity created by the freedom the game gives you. Most open world games set in modern times depend entirely on bullets, and you're doing the exact same things no matter the content you're playing because their variety is built around a fixed playstyle. This is a problem negatively amplified when the developers only have one intended solution for the problem a mission presents, and you're punished or ignored when trying anything else. Cyberpunk, on the other hand, accommodates multiple playstyles and allows for missions to be completed based on the proficiency of your build and your choices. This is seen most frequently in gigs. Level design for gigs is straight out of the Immersive Sim playbook, with different routes you can take based on the gameplay style you've chosen. While the game does lack the trademark immersive sim rule set that you can exploit, it compensates for this with its unique gameplay approaches and insurance to the player that they're all viable. For example, there's a gig where you have to get rid of a club owner. You can shoot the place up and kill the owner. You can also sneak into his office and convince him to leave Night City. But if you're high level enough when you come across this gig and have invested points into netrunning perks, you can ping the devices in the club, hack into the camera in his office through a wall, and persuade him to take his own life. Then you walk out of the club like nothing's happened, and you get a bonus for completing the gig without any gratuitous violence. The best part of the gameplay is easily how rewarding it feels when your build comes together and how it changes the way you play the game. During my first playthrough, I committed to the body attribute, and as a result, barely had any points in intelligence. This meant that I didn't pass the skill check required to merge all the Delamain personalities at the end of his questline. Now, in my second playthrough as a netrunner, I decided to prioritize intelligence, and while my early game was much harder due to a lack of points to invest in body, I did finally unlock the option to merge all of Del's personalities. Something which made me really happy because I cared about all the Delamains and the option's existence reflected my dedication to my build. You can't have it all in Cyberpunk, and I love that. I love that there's consequences even to the decisions you make about your power fantasy. The Cyberpunk power fantasy is another place where the game's presentation steps in to make sure you're adequately immersed by the countless tools of destruction at your disposal. Needless to say, Western RPGs aren't exactly known for their combat fluidity, neither in terms of gameplay smoothness or nuanced combat choices. Cyberpunk's incredible combat is a more than welcome departure from the norm. Through all my years playing first-person shooters, the ones that satisfied me the most were those that made me feel unbeatable. Cyberpunk achieves this with the added benefit of featuring more than just guns. Until my third playthrough, I didn't even use them. I was having too much fun with blades, arm cyberware, and hacking. The end result of Cyberpunk's combat design and endless weapon choices is, plain and simple, a fun fucking time. Opening frequently asked questions. Item, why can't I kill more than 50 people? Answer, the fuck is wrong with you? Please go see a therapist, you psycho. Before Cyberpunk 2077, my favorite game of all time was Saints Row 2, and it wouldn't have been the same to me without The Boss, Johnny, Shondi, Pierce, and Carlos. You were all criminals, but the camaraderie among the Saints was special, and that made taking down the rival gangs in Stillwater an unforgettable experience. Characters have a lot of importance to me in the games I play, no matter the genre. They're what separates a good game from a great game. They help make the story engaging, they make you want to progress through it, 
and they are the lifeblood of any narrative-based RPG. The characters of Cyberpunk 2077 are the best I've ever seen in a game, and what puts its cast on that other level for me is how real they feel. Johnny is like an old friend. Victor and Misty are really looking out for me, and I've been through some shit with Pan Am, Judy, River, and Carrie. It took me a long time to understand why Cyberpunk's characters feel so human. Video games have ingrained in us that you talk to characters to further a game's storyline or to get a reward. RPGs specifically have also drilled into our heads that players revolve around quest givers and that you solve all your problems alone. This means that, in most games, you only interact with their characters on a transactional basis and just at the start and end of the quests they give you. This is not real life. Video game quests are rarely structured like any real life situations, and I certainly don't get a cool sword or a book of incantations if I help my friend move. I would however get to spend time with them and talk about things going on in their lives. This disconnect occurs because games have limitations. Most games literally cannot afford to create missions that don't progress the story or feed into other gameplay mechanics. Nothing you see in games is free, and developers have to weigh the importance of creating certain mechanics over others. It's far more work to build all the systems necessary for a character to accompany you on a set of missions than to stick them in one place they never move from. In Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, for example, you're never doing anything personal with your fellow kindred. Its characters are static entities that you gravitate around, and you seldom know who they are because you see into their lives you know who they are based only on how they treat you. We get to understand Cyberpunk's characters on a deeper level because it liberates them from many of the technical conventions of video games. There are numerous quests that have no combat at all, and you're not doing them because you get something tangible out of them, you're doing them purely because you want to spend time with the character the quest is about. The content of the quests themselves also defies what we'd expect from a game. You help pick out a remembrance for Jackie's funeral with Misty. You go to the movies with Rogue. You play with River's family, and you bang heads at a concert with Carrie. These are not typical video game situations, but Cyberpunk creates them to help you grow a stronger connection with its characters by putting you in real life scenarios. Until Cyberpunk, I'd never played a game like this where I truly helped anyone. A lot of the game's quests are just being there for people as they go through some of the hardest moments in their lives or deal with issues they never came to terms with. There's a lot of moments in this game where people are reduced to their raw feelings, something which games rarely get to show us because scenes like this aren't usually considered essential outside of cutscenes. With Cyberpunk, it's the little things too. The game's facial animation is incredible. You can see when characters disagree with your replies, when they're thinking about things, and when they're happy. Cyberpunk also has the best looking eyes I've ever seen in a game. It feels like the characters are really looking at you. This is what a game of this scope can do. It can put resources into systems that give us new experiences. The reason its characters feel so human is because we see sides of them that games never show us. Unfortunately for us, creating bonds with such complex characters means that our relationships with them come at a greater emotional cost than is standard for most games. Cyberpunk knows that we love its characters, and it uses those feelings to create difficult choices for the player. Nothing encapsulates this better than the game's endings. Mike Pondsmith once said that Cyberpunk isn't about saving humanity, it's about saving yourself. While this can certainly be interpreted in a literal way concerning V, in the context of the game's endings, I see it a bit differently. In all of Cyberpunk's endings, someone dies. Rogue, Saul and the Nomads, Johnny. I played through all these endings, and none of them felt right. It wasn't necessarily because the stories ended in a dark manner, or because V would die no matter what. It was this inescapable feeling that someone had died because of me. I see game endings as one big question. What 
have you learned? Prior to Cyberpunk, my favorite game ending was six words. Pokemon Trainer Red wants to battle. In Pokemon Silver, you set out to become the champion. Red is the game's final test because he's the best, and beating him proves that you've learned everything the game had to teach on its journey. I see Cyberpunk's endings in the same way. What have you learned? For me, the answer lies in the idea that Cyberpunk isn't just about V. It's also about the people V meets and how their lives are changed by your interactions with them. The game's standard endings are so hard for me to swallow because in each of them, you lead someone who trusted you to their death. Of course, it goes without saying that Cyberpunk isn't just about V because it's also about Johnny. I think Johnny's role in the story is intricate. As the game progresses, his responsibilities to the narrative change along with his character as a whole. Johnny is a moral compass, he's a cautionary tale, but most importantly, he's a friend. By the end of the game, Johnny no longer views V as an obstacle. He sees them as a friend he's trying to save. As much as Johnny is changing V, V has changed Johnny too. I believe we're not just given glimpses of Johnny's past to understand him and his plight. We are also shown Johnny's memories so we don't repeat his mistakes. When you said you let your friends down, did you mean Rogue? Rogue, Alt, Carrie, Santiago. I know you and Pan Am got a thing going. You don't want to rope her into this. Made the same mistake myself once. Johnny warns us of the implications of each ending. The game itself is keenly aware of the moral conundrums facing V and the player with the choice they make. Or you can try Pan Am and her tarmac rats, but then their lives will weigh heavy on your soul. Or you take Arasaka's deal, but then you'll have your own soul on your conscience. When I originally played Cyberpunk, I called Pan Am first, and while this ending overall is fairly optimistic, the deaths of Bobby, Teddy, and Saul were unacceptable. Then I let Johnny ask Rogue for help, and Rogue died too. As a last resort, I sold my soul to Arasaka, and the price for my stupidity was Johnny. In desperation, I tried the only other ending available, and as I wondered if I made the right choice, it only took a few of this ending's hollow calls to convince me I hadn't. I was out of options, or so I thought. It was hard for me to believe that a game with so much attention to detail would force me to make what I considered impossible decisions. I looked online to see if the game had another ending, and it did. I didn't spoil myself on what happened in the ending, but I did see how you unlocked it. Cyberpunk's secret ending comes down to a few dialogue options in the quest Chippin' In. I loaded a save I had from around that point, chose correctly, and replayed the rest just to see what the last ending was like. After going through the trouble of meeting the requirements for this ending, I sat on that balcony not knowing what it was or what would happen as I stared at Johnny and options that I wasn't satisfied with. I've been playing video games for over 20 years, and this scene was the first time I ever felt one was speaking directly to me. Kinda of tough deciding which of your friends get to die, isn't it? Good news is you got this one Chum who's already dead. And he'd be honored to join you on a wild suicide run. If I gotta die, I'd rather fall into my grave gun and hand it on fire. And not drag anyone down with me. Huh. You just discovered what it takes to become a legend. Grab your iron. Let's mobilize. Don't Fear the Reaper was exactly the ending I needed. It's also the most effective way a game has ever asked me what I've learned by playing it. From a gameplay perspective, it's Cyberpunk's hardest ending, and the culmination of all the time spent on your build as you take on Arasaka alone. You cannot save, and if you die, the credits roll, and you get the same holocalls you do as when you take your own life. I failed multiple times trying to finish this, but that just made finally reaching the end 
all the more rewarding. Few things worth having come easy, but what this ending offered me in terms of the game's narrative was certainly worth fighting for. I don't think Don't Fear the Reaper is about a happy ending. It's why the ending makes you happy that's the point. I couldn't get over that people died helping me. Even if they agreed to help, I still put them in that situation by interjecting myself in their lives. It didn't feel responsible, and it felt like what Johnny was trying to warn me about because he had already experienced something similar. The feeling I had after every ending was the same feeling I had when V looks at the mirror during the heist. And I think that's when I understood what Cyberpunk was trying to teach me. One person had already died for this insanity, and that was one person too many. I had no choice then, but I did now. Cyberpunk isn't about saving humanity, it's about saving yourself. Cyberpunk's other endings weren't for me, because V's literal livelihood wasn't as important to me as whether or not they could live with the decisions they made. Don't Fear the Reaper is my favorite ending because I realized that only by saving my conscience could I save myself. Now, a question many may ask is, why does picking the correct dialogue options in Chippin' In decide whether or not you get the secret ending? Cyberpunk 2077 is a game that tries to depict relationships in a realistic manner. We've gone over the great lengths it goes to to mimic the way you interact with people in real life. People are complicated, and therefore, friendships are complicated. A friendship where you agree with a person 100% of the time isn't a friendship. It's sycophancy. During your conversation at the oil fields, Johnny doesn't need to be told that what he did in V's body is water under the bridge or that his emotions don't matter. He needs to hear that he broke V's trust. He needs to hear the truth so that he can reflect on his actions and learn from them. If you trust Johnny enough to tell him this, then he trusts you enough to propose that you two storm Arasaka Tower alone. Cyberpunk has two protagonists, V and Johnny Silverhand, and it's only when they're fully synchronized through the choices you make in the story that you get their ending. It's honestly amazing that a game has this degree of choice and thought put behind character motivations, though I guess that's why Cyberpunk matters to us, isn't it? I've never played a game where I can't listen to some of its songs after finishing it, where the player base associates its music with bad memories they don't want to relive. But that's the thing, Cyberpunk is a game. These events didn't really happen to us, or did they? We may not have physically lived them, but our reactions and feeling towards them are certainly genuine. I think questions like this are part of the next-gen narrative experience offered by Cyberpunk. For as much as games have pushed visuals and overall quality of life over the past decade, it's rare when a game of this scale actually evolves the presentation of its story. Like all great games, Cyberpunk is one that learned from those that came before it, and it used that knowledge to strengthen its own vision of what a game could be. When I look at Cyberpunk 2077, I see echoes through time. It's every game I've ever loved, and more. If I had to choose just one video game experience to keep in my memories for the rest of my days, I'd choose Cyberpunk. I never want to forget Night City, and everything that happened while I was there.